So is space travel possible? That's the question I would like to, to address to you, but the answer is already here. Yes, it is. Since 50 years, we made this dream of humanity becoming true. Let's pretend this is our spaceship. I'm the commandant, and you are all now invited to sit down, sit belt fastened. We are traveling to the universe. And outside the window, you see this beauty. But in order to achieve this has been, you know, an incredible challenge. And if we even reached the moon, which is, uh, you know, such an extreme environment, and working here as human is very difficult because we need technology in order to survive. And when we designed the moon base 15 years ago, as a designer, we were challenged because on the moon there is no air, different gravity, so there is no water. All you have to bring from Earth, also the structure you see here, are inflatable ones, very lightweight, you transport it, you inflate it, and then we cover it with the local material, which is this very fine sand, it's called regolith, and you protect the astronaut inside. This to tell you that uh, resources we have are very valuable, and once now we start to travel to space, we need to know how to manage them better. And on the background, you see this beautiful sphere, blue sphere, which is our planet Earth. And here, we are very lucky because we have everything that we need, like air, food, energy, and water. And water is actually what I would like to, to tell you today as a story, is the Warka water story, where every drop counts. So, next question will be, can we find different ways to provide water? In 2012, we went to Africa, we discovered this beautiful country, Ethiopia. It was like traveling back in time to another age, as you can see from the image. But at the same time, we have faced this, you know, dramatic need, which is the lack of water. So seeing with my eyes children and women looking for water every day and collecting water from unsafe sources that share it with animals and putting it inside this water tank, they carry on and are very heavy. As, as you can see, they walk for several kilometers without shoes. So I was wondering, can we do something? And statistics are telling us that 60% of the population in Ethiopia is actually suffering this problem. And 15 liters of water for a person for a day will be enough for hygiene and for consumption. But actually these people that even don't have such a small quantity. And in the meantime, on our planet, not far from here, the consumption by day is up to 500 liters today, which is incredible. And this is the Emirates, where 100 years ago there was no water and people that were nomads going around because they couldn't even join because no resources. So things changed quickly. But in order to achieve it, they also consume an enormous amount of energy. So starting to, to brainstorming how to find a solution for this, uh, to help this problem, we look at inspirational, you know, idea. And for sure, nature is always an incredible source, as well as old tradition, ancient tradition, and local tradition. And the Warka tree, which is an institution in Ethiopia, it is a huge tree, and underneath the community is uh, creating meeting and is a gathering place. So the shade of the tree is a very pleasant place where to, you know, to stay when it's very hot. At the same time, the tree is providing food because it's a ficus. So they respect the tree because it's doing so much for them. And the Warka water wants to be also this a social, you know, place where people, they can, they can do social activity. And looking at nature, we have also inspiration how to collect water. The spider web is very efficient, as you can see. So the spider uses this water to drink, but also to attract other insects. As well as this uh, incredible insect, the Nabi beetle, which doesn't need an explication of what it's doing, and is living in one of the most arid places in our planet. The lotus effect, also very important, 
which is the capacity of a material to repel the water. You see from the picture the drops are like a sphere. We believed before this was because the surface of the leaves was very flat. But recently, thanks to technology, we actually discovered, looking to it in detail, that the surface is very bumpy. And when the drop of water is following, by the energy, extreme energy of the, of the shell, of the surface around, it keeps the shape and the spherical shape. And this allowed, with the geometry and the inclination, to make this uh, super hydrophobic effect, which is important to collect water. The cactus, we have several kinds of cactus, from the small one to the tallest one. All of them, they know how to collect water from the air, and they survive in very arid places in our planet. A cactus like this can go up to 20 meters, and inside it can store up to 750 liters of water. So a huge quantity, a huge weight. And the reason why, if you section the cactus, you have this uh, star uh, shape, is because like this, it can increase and decrease depending on how much water is, uh, is, uh, is capable to collect. And all these little hairs around, they are designed for collecting water, but also to preventing evaporation. And moreover, the spines that we believe they were, you know, only a future for protecting a defensive, we discovered that recently they are very uh, well and performant in uh, water collection. But also looking at the history and our, you know, uh, tradition, we found this incredible aircraft. These were done more than 2,000 years ago. These are called the Duponts. We are in the South England. And this structure, human-made, are designed to collect water by condensation. And some of those still working, and uh, archaeologists, they discovered the function only recently. And they give, still provide water to livestock. Or going down to the Mediterranean area, we found these walls and structure down with dry stones. So this structure, some of them, Today, we don't know the reason why, but some of them we are discovering, they were actually water collectors. So the air with humidity passing inside these gaps between the stones, finding inside these places a cooler environment. So the air release the humidity and the water to the stones, and drop by drops, we collect the, the water, basically. But also very important has been looking to local manufacturing technique. We are in Africa, and you see the way in Africa they construct it. Very simply, they use local resources. It's a community work, all joined together. No scaffolding, no electrical tools, just manual work. And they do beautiful houses with that, and also very sustainable. So with all these inputs and these needs, we start to brainstorming and to design what is the work of water. Three years of work, and the design is uh, in evolution. And we reached today the fourth version. And we built so far 11 prototypes, full-scale prototypes to test it. Now I will show you more in detail the third version, which we built and we achieved recently, three weeks ago, finally in Ethiopia. It's the very first prototype constructed. So that's the first time I'm showing the images of the, the structure constructed. So it's designed to be modular. The modules can be mounted one on top of the other, and you can reach the total height of 10 meters by like this. As you can see, it's uh, meant and designed to collect rainwater, or as well, humidity in the air, so fog. But when there is no fog and not rain, we can collect condensation when there is the right difference in temperature between night and day. So. The design is very simple. We have the mesh, which is this uh, textile that is designed to collect the water from the fog. Then we have the collector that collecting the drop of water following. And also, it works as a condenser, water condenser. Then we have the water tank, which is a flexible structure, very lightweight. More water you have, and the shape will change. And then we have the, the, the bamboo structure all around, which is holding and make it stable. And the canopy around, which is meant to create a shade, a space underneath, so people, they can go, they can, you know, rest and enjoy the nice microclimate because it's cooler, it's fresher. At the same time, 
we reduce the evaporation of the soil. So around the Warka, the temperature is lower, and we need it during the night because with this difference in temperature, we condense more water. Behind the project, there is a lot of research we are conducting. One is about the meteorological system. So planet Earth is doing all the, the work for us. It's evaporating the water and releasing the water in the air. We have rivers of water in our, over our heads, passing and floating. If we manage to reach and catch and harvest this water, we don't need heavy and expensive infrastructure. We have it more or less everywhere. So from the very first prototype, we are still testing in Italy under different conditions. We have been developing the project and trying different materials. This is the very first mesh we tested that is not designed specifically for water collection, but still works and is working well. But recently, we are using a, a, a custom-made, I think it's the first custom-made uh, mesh designed for water collection. And this is already five times better than the previous one. It's a three-dimensional textile, very lightweight and very resistant. So, like this, we are also studying and developing different other materials, and we built a special equipment that we call Warcuino, which is based on our Arduino motherboard, and we connect to it sensor actuators and uh, what we need in order to survey all the environmental conditions and also the quantity of water that we collect. And this is uh, uh, giving uh, online information real time. So wherever we are, we can access to this information and check the status of the, the project. And so we did in Ethiopia before installing the tower, we have been checking and analyzing the different meteorological condition because it's a big country and there's a different environment. And we select several possible locations, and out of those, we choose one, which is called Dorze. We are in the south Ethiopia. And here, the community that we have been working for more or less two months in order to build it. So very nice people. They didn't know what we wanted to do. They didn't know me. So they've been at the beginning skeptical, skeptical, because they were wondering, you know, what this guy they want to do. And these people are weaver. They weave everything. So from the threads to the manufacturing of textile, and they live out of this in a very respectful way with the, with the, with the environment. And they use, actually, natural fiber, as you can see from here. They plant these uh, false banana trees, and with this, they do a lot. They eat almost the entire tree, and what, with what is left, they produce these fibers. As you can see, the lady on your left is, uh, is getting some, uh, some, uh, some material out of the, of the plant, and this is used, once it's baked, to do kind of bread. But the leftover is not wasted, but actually, the man on your right is using this fiber to make cables. And you can customize your cable depending on what you need. So we are adapting this technology that we discover while we are there, as well as the bamboo, which is very present there because Ethiopia has a huge production of bamboo. It's the highlands bamboo, it's called, and it grows in three years more than 10 meters. So you have this you know, material available, and you can see human manufacture and, uh, and, uh, and nature are integrated in such an harmonious way. We have so much to learn out of it, and they even do the houses with this technique. And this is the houses, the incredible one I discovered there. They are called the, the Dorze Hut. So the one on your left is the new one. At the beginning, they are 15 meters tall. They build it only with one material, bamboo. But little by little, they get lower up to the other one you see on your right. And when they are like this, they abandon it. And then they use it for the waiting. But they take 80 years. So in order to, to, to diminish the height. And this because the bamboo in contact with the terrain, little by little get ruined, and the termites are eating the, the building. So they cut it every year, five centimeters, so the building comes, goes down and down. So they don't go against nature, but they follow it, and they integrate with it. So this is the lesson we learn out of it, and also the beauty of the, of the construction. 
But at the same time in the village, they still have this, uh, this problem of lack of water. Even if water is present, doesn't mean that the water is potable or is easily accessible. They have still to do this every day and many times every day. And also they have to carry this uh, very heavy du duty, you know, water tank back home. While in the same village, you have a lot of humidity, moisture in the air. It is an highland. We are 2,500 meters above, above the sea level, and there is a big lake nearby. So the, the structure, as I told you before, is simple. Three material bamboo is a natural wire and a polyester mesh. And we have been designing it since the very beginning with simple tools because I was aware that in Africa we may not have found in this rural place many tools. But making it there, we managed and we learned how to do it out of one tool. This one is a local tool, the one they used to, to, to make it. And I went there with the intention to tell them and teach them how to, 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 you know, to make it. But actually, I learned a lot from them. They have an incredible experience and know-how because they do it naturally. For them, it's natural to work with bamboo. Wow. They split it with the ends, and you know, they are very fast, much better than, uh, than me. So I was very happy because finally I also understood that was the right place where to, to do that and the right people to, to construct it. So some picture of the structure and the construction. And this is the structure, almost finished. So the, mean, the goal is to be easy to be used, low cost, low environmental impact. So 100 liters of water every day costs less than $1,000 and to be built in one day. Actually, to mount it is even less, as you can see. It's very fast, so half an hour and it is done. It's a, a collaborative work. There is all the community, you know, behind it, trying to, to help and to learn. So I've been waiting to install it in order to have the feedback from them. And uh, I was very nervous to see how they will have reacted. So after we did it, this was the, the response of them seeing it. So, very last time finish. This is just an example, but what we want to bring as a message is that our planet is beautiful, and looking from here, from the space station, it's also very fragile. What I want to ask you now is to change. Now you're not more passenger, but leave your comfortable couch and act. Act with your energy, with your skills, with what you can do, with your financial means, in order to make something for our planet, because we can change it the way we are, you know, doing it now. And every drop counts. Thank you.